dark energy could be the key to Mass Effect 5. So let's break down dark energy, element zero, the Scourge and the Geth, and every single connection to these in every game. And then go over my theories related to how I think these could be involved in Mass Effect 5. First, here is everything you need to know about dark energy. And dark energy is something that already exists within our real world. It's a relatively recent discovery, so there's still a lot that is unknown about dark energy. But it's essentially a form of energy that is responsible for the accelerating expansion of the universe. Dark energy is also the dominant component of the universe, contributing to 68% of the total energy in the present-day observable universe. In the Mass Effect universe, Dark energy is able to be manipulated by element zero, which is a rare material mined and used for mass relays, faster than light travel, and if ingested, can even give a person biotic abilities. When element zero is subjected to powerful electrical currents, element zero releases dark energy that can be harnessed to create mass effect fields, effectively raising or lowering the relative mass of all objects within the fields. For individuals who can use biotics, ESO nodules and natural electrical impulses in their nervous system allow them to generate and wield dark energy biologically. When it comes to mass effect fields, element zero can increase the mass content of space-time when subjected to an electrical current via dark energy, meaning that with a positive current, mass is created, and with a negative current, mass is decreased. Low mass effect fields allow for faster than light travel and surface to orbit travel. High mass effect fields create artificial gravity and push space debris from starships. And something I didn't know was that of course using biotics can drain the user, but it actually creates a static electrical charge. Ships have to touch ground to release this charge. And for biotic users, they experience an occasional static shock when touching metal or other people. And in Mass Effect, dark matter shows up in three distinct settings. One in the foundation of Mass Effect itself. It's used by biotics, as I just explained, while also being important in faster than light travel, and specifically the mass relays. Mass Effect is part of the basis of the entire series, but Dark energy has a few distinct story-related threads. And before I go into detail about the dark energy connections within the games, I want to go over the current possible dark energy teases we've seen so far in all of the release information about Mass Effect 5. Starting with the 2020 teaser trailer. In this we hear, anomalies found all across space. This audio also happens after the audio of the Reaper, so this line will most likely connect to the next game and is setting up space-related anomalies. Additionally, in the trailer itself, we see what looks like a nebula and a focus on stars, and this shape shown here is highlighted in the middle of the trailer and at the very end, while anomalies all across space is being said. While this does look like space matter, it also looks very similar to the Scourge and similar to this unique energy looking string of particles from the concept art of this very trailer. Shortly after the trailer was revealed, concept artist Marco Iazzi shared some of the concept art behind the trailer itself. And these seem to have possible dark energy concepts, possible dying stars and other space related clues. This piece is titled Reaching Twin Star and the only real, real-life concepts I could find that related to this were these dying stars. They have the same hourglass shape, and this is more similar to what ended up actually being in the trailer. Both of these pieces are titled Twin Star, and additionally we have this piece which seems to show the process of a dying star, and this piece is titled Glowing Star Explosion. But out of these concept arts, this is the most interesting piece. This piece is titled Approaching Planet and seems to have this red explosion with red tendrils following in its wake. Not only does this seem to be some kind of explosion or source of concentrated energy, it's also approaching this planet, made obvious by the name. 
These tendrils and the overall anatomy of this red cloud type of anomaly looks very similar to the scourge. I made a video about these concepts and specifically these pieces and the possibility of this being a dying star. And Gamble did like it, so maybe I was onto something. Additionally, this 2021 Mass Effect Will Continue poster also looks like it has element zero within this crater. And this crater looks like it was created by a massive impact and has dead Gath bodies surrounding the destruction. And I've seen some say that there is dead Quarians here, and I see the shape of one, but the size doesn't make sense in comparison to the Geth. So I don't think this is actually a Quarian. To me, this only looks like Geth in the rubble. Either way, this blue in the middle definitely looks like element zero. And lastly, the Citadel poster released in 2021 looks like it has the element zero icon in the middle of the Presidium. This image looks almost exactly like the image on the Wikipedia and what we see in game. And it also has that bright flare we've seen associated with element zero. So there are the possible clues we've been shown. With that, let's go over the dark energy story threads that could continue in Mass Effect 5. In Mass Effect 2, we know at the time that lead writer Drew Karpishin and the writing team was setting up the dark energy as a possible main story thread that would continue into Mass Effect 3's ending. This was never fleshed out and was ultimately not the direction that was taken, but the dark energy plot thread was never continued, so we never get a conclusion to the actual story. And if you're unfamiliar with this dark energy concept, in short summary, dark energy was something only organics could access, and reapers were wiping out organics because they would use biotics and dark energy to the point that it was essentially pushing the universe closer and closer to the big crunch, opposite of the big bang. Wanting to survive, the reapers were trying to stop this. And the only way to stop this was by using biotics, which meant the reapers had to rely on humans to be able to do this. It essentially reframes the reapers motivations as selfish, but still for the better of the galaxy. So ultimately, I don't think this is important considering they didn't go this route, and the actual in-game story is more important and could be the perfect way to connect the trilogy to Mass Effect 5. In Mass Effect 2, we meet Tally on the planet Haystrom during her recruitment mission. We learn that she went there to get a sample from the planet to get a timeline of the rate of radiation increase. But her equipment wasn't working properly due to the sun's radiation. Haystrom star Dolan was aging faster than normal and turning into a red giant. As Dolan was rapidly maturing, the system experienced magnetic eruptions and an increased solar output. Dolan was destabilizing rapidly for unknown reasons, which Tally says didn't make sense because when it was a Quarian colony, it was a normal star. While we don't know exactly how long Dolan was destabilizing, we know that the Morning War began in 1895. And this means the star had to have begun destabilizing sometime after the Geth took over Haystrom in 1896. And there's a little bit of conflicting information here, as Tally says that when Haystrom was a Quarian colony, Dolan was a normal star. But the Codex says that the Quarians colonized Haystrom specifically to study its destabilizing star. But I'm going to choose Tally's in-game story over the Codex as canon. Either way, it was taken over by the Geth at the beginning of the Morning War. And it was shortly after this that communication from the planet and surrounding space stations stopped completely. And what's odd about this planet and star is that the Geth didn't seem to view the sun's activity as a threat. They maintained their presence on the planet and even continued establishing several space stations near Haystrom. Even still, Dolan's magnetic eruptions and solar output still overwhelm most communications near it. So it's unsure how the Geth were able to continue their own activity on the planet. Through Tally's research, we know that the Quarians suspected dark energy to be the cause of Dolan's rapid aging. Tally says that she suspects dark energy was affecting the interior of Dolan, which would cause a similar effect as a star blowing off mass to enter a red giant phase. But Haystrom's star was too young for this to be a natural cause. 
and it seems like she suspected an artificial accelerant behind Dolan's destabilization. Aside from the sun's impending doom, there was a lot of geth activity on Haystrom. Spy probe scans indicate extensive orbital construction around Haystrom, housing thousands of geth platforms and an unknown number of geth software. It is not known how many geth are on Haystrom since the radiation interfered with scans. And based on scans and based on the geth's mining, refining, and fabricating activity on the planet, estimates suggest that Haystrom has roughly 20 more years of use before all of its resources are exhausted. And Tally was sent here by the Korean Admiralty Board. So this was causing enough of a concern that even Korean leadership wanted it to be investigated. So much so to the point that they were even willing to risk the lives of all the Koreans that ended up dying on Haystrom. Additionally, in Mass Effect 2, we also meet Gianna Parasini again, and this time she's on Ilium. She tells us she is doing research due to recent hacking, and she wants to make sure they are external. She says a lot of people are suddenly interested in dark energy, and her bosses want to know if it's something to worry about. So it seems there was both an increase of people interested in dark energy to the point that there were several incidents of hacking to get information about dark energy. So Mass Effect 2 set up dark energy in more than one way, not only connecting to the larger Mass Effect universe, but also the Geth, which we know are returning. Haystrom was not only dealing with the death of its star Dolan, but despite everyone else struggling to use technology near the planet because of this radiation, we know that the Geth were unbothered by the radiation and that whatever technology they had was able to be used despite the radiation and interference from Dolan dying. They also made this planet a sort of super hub, storing thousands of Geth units on the planet. And while we see Korean architecture during Tally's mission, the Geth were building all around the planet and were continuing to build space stations. And for what reason, we have no idea. We have no idea why there were thousands of Geth units here or why this planet was chosen as a hub for the Geth. Nor do we know how they were able to circumvent the radiation effects. We also know that Tally suspected that the cause of Dolan's destabilization was not natural and that there could have been an artificial reason behind it. And like I said, there's a little bit of a contradiction of the timeline but based on what Tally said, it seems that Dolan started destabilizing after the Geth arrived. And we know that it was shortly after they seized the planet that communication was cut off. So there's a ton of possibilities here. This specific story thread connects the dark energy, the Geth, the Koreans, and possible strange technology that we know the Geth already had access to with their construction of the Geth telescope. And I'll get more into that later, but aside from the story thread on Haystrom, Gianna Parasini's story thread was setting up a greater connection to prominent figures in the galaxy. And those prominent figures were desperately trying to get information on dark energy. And these were not the only two mentions of dark energy in Mass Effect 2. Another dark energy story thread set up in Mass Effect 2 in the Arrival DLC was around the mysterious object Rho found in the Bahawk system. During arrival, Dr. Kenson tells us that she learns about the invasion from a device called Object Row. Object Row is a Reaper artifact discovered among the asteroids around the relay itself. We don't know why there is a Reaper artifact in an asteroid, and she goes on to say that Object Row still contains powers and gave her visions of the Reaper invasions. Essentially, Object Row was using vast amounts of dark energy to maintain itself and to maintain the barriers protecting it so that it can continue broadcasting its Reaper signals. And while the events of Arrival are a little bit convoluted lore-wise, especially considering our main source of information, Dr. Kenson did become indoctrinated, we do learn that the Alpha Relay, the oldest known mass relay in the galaxy, can make use of hidden dark energy reserves. When the relay's controls are adjusted, the relay can tap into an unprecedented amount of dark energy, dramatically extending its range 
to 16 other mass relays and even the Citadel. What Object Row actually was is uncertain, but it appears to be another Reaper artifact indoctrination device that was going to great lengths with dark energy to protect itself. And obviously, Object Row was destroyed in the end, but this still opens up additional possibilities around dark energy. Not only are we seeing it related to Reaper artifacts, most likely made for indoctrination, but we also learned that the Alpha Relay was unique and could connect to 16 other relays and even the Citadel. And while the Alpha Relay was also destroyed, it still opens up possibilities that other older relays could also have this capability, maybe even after the Reapers were destroyed. Additionally, we learned that Dark Energy was able to be used as a sort of force field, which we haven't seen used like this before. Unfortunately, none of these plot threads were continued in Mass Effect 3. We don't see Gianna Parasini again, we don't learn what happened to Haystrom or Dolan, and we don't find out what happened to the Geth on Haystrom. And then we don't see any of the dropped energy dark threads for Mass Effect 3's ending. But this means that these threads are still open, and possibilities are endless, considering there are no finalities on any of these stories. They can continue, and I think they will and should. Not only because they introduce an interesting concept, but also because they could help tie in Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 with Andromeda, which we know is happening in some capacity. So with all the dark energy connections from the original trilogy explained, let's break down the Scourge, which I think would be the best way to connect all the games. And as a reminder, the Scourge isn't 100% defined yet, which leaves a lot of room for the writers to mold it to fit whatever they need it to fit, which is why I think it could be relevant to Mass Effect 5. But timeline-wise, from what we apparently know, the Scourge was created when it was detonated on key to Sira around 2450, which would be almost 300 years after the events of Mass Effect 3. So if we do get a jump in the timeline to Andromeda's 2819, then the Scourge would still be around. But if this next game takes place closer to the Reaper War, then from what we kind of know, the Scourge wouldn't be around just yet. But again, there are several ways they could write this, which I'll get into my theories later, but let's look at what the Scourge is actually speculated to be. In Andromeda, it is heavily speculated that the Scourge is composed of dark energy, and it is speculated that the Scourge is also of artificial origin. And while there's mostly speculation around the Scourge, it is confirmed to have element zero within it. But even though the Scourge is suspected to be made of dark energy, it does not behave in the way that existing theories work with dark energy. And everything around the Scourge is still very much up for speculation and debate. While scientists in Andromeda were studying it, it was a new phenomenon that hadn't been seen before, and they had only been studying it for less than two years. And while the Scourge is heavily connected to the Angara, even to them it was largely a mystery. Some scientists believe that the Scourge is a dark energy phenomenon in the literal sense, meaning a form of energy that has no electromagnetic interaction and thus cannot be detected, hence the term dark, which is different from dark energy, which is actually tangible. According to the Codex, the Scourge is a term used to describe the huge and extremely dangerous phenomenon that has spread across the Helios Cluster. It spreads in tendrils appearing to be some kind of expanding cloud, and this cloud affects everything within its surroundings, destroying starships that attempt to pass through or near it. Observations and data from the Nexus show that these Scourge tendrils are radioactive element zero rich dust and debris. Within the tendrils, thousands of microscopic and unstable warps in space-time are constantly erupting. These distortions build up a charge in the ESO, causing uncontrolled mass effects that alter gravity. The presence of the Scourge also affects nearby planets, raining down radioactive fallout and debris, and even altering the orbits of the worlds that pass through or near it. Sounds pretty similar to this concept art. The Scourge is also aggressively drawn to remnant structures on planets, though the cause of the attraction is unknown. 
This manifests as further tendrils of dust and radioactive particulates that cling to the surface of the remnant technology and interfere with its operations. Either this matter was left behind after the planet in question passed through the scourge itself, or even distant interactions with remnant technology can cause the scourge to coalesce spontaneously. And there was no long-range data that showed any sign of the scourge before the initiative departed the Milky Way galaxy, meaning when the Andromeda Initiative used the Geth telescope to observe the Helios cluster, it was scourge-free. And the Codex says that the scourge is the fallout of a weapon detonated at Key to Sira. Dr. Eridana believes the weapon caused an instantaneous cluster-wide warping of space-time, briefly connecting multiple points in the Helios cluster at once. Her model suggests that the warp effect annihilated multiple planets, forming the debris in the scourge's tendrils, while the resulting radiation converted much of that debris into element zero. The space-time warping effect continues on a micro scale within the scourge today. So essentially the scourge itself is defying science and is constantly warping space and time. Dr. Eridana even says they've barely scratched the surface on the scourge. And while the contents of the scourge are still a mystery, the most interesting part of the scourge is how it was spread. The detonation itself was able to spread across the entire Helios cluster in a way that the detonation opened up various points by bending space-time to have access to several locations at once. And at a microscopic scale, the tendrils themselves are constantly erupting, causing unstable warps in space-time. That means that if the scourge was artificially created, someone had access to technology that would help in the spread of the scourge, and that technology was able to connect multiple locations at once by warping time and space. This in itself is extremely interesting, but it also tells us that if the scourge was intentionally created, this technology existed 300 years after Mass Effect 3. And again, Andromeda scientists aren't 100% sure that the scourge is dark energy because it doesn't behave the way that existing theories surrounding dark energy explain its behavior. The only confirmed materials of the scourge are ice, mineral debris, element zero, and unknown materials. And while it doesn't exactly behave like dark energy, its behavior shows that it seems to be drawn to technology, especially remnant technology. And it also seems to be drawn to black holes. And element zero forms in the aftermath of a supernova when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected by the energy of a dying star and exploding. And we know that the Scourge is attracted to black holes because the Helios Cluster has a black hole that we know was interacting with the Scourge just like this. H012, known as the Ketos Black Hole, is at the center of the Helios Cluster. And there is evidence that some of the Scourge's mass is being drawn into the black hole, causing currents in the phenomenon. Additionally, this black hole is unique and is a Kerr black hole that absorbed additional mass from the nearby systems. Andromeda scientists have suggested that without the black hole, the scourge phenomenon might have been even more hazardous. And we know that element zero is far more common in the Helios cluster rather than the Milky Way galaxy. And that is speculated to be largely from this black hole releasing radiation, which then turns into element zero. And Atharia explained it much better than I did regarding the black hole connection, so go check out her video. But essentially, everything is connected. Dark energy is attracted to technology, which uses mass relays, which use element zero. And the scourge, which contains element zero and suspected dark energy, is attracted to remnant technology, which is also known to be comprised of element zero. And the scourge is attracted to the element zero within black holes, which then creates more element zero and also affects the scourge activity. And while I don't want this, this black hole itself seems like it could open up different aspects of time travel, especially since it's theorized that a parent black hole and a daughter black hole can connect via wormhole. And there is a black hole in both the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy. So yes, ultimately, if they want to, they could go this route. I don't really think I'd enjoy it, but it is possible. 
They can do instantaneous travel or time jumps or time travel. And this opens up a ton of questions regarding the timeline, especially if you have people jumping between the galaxies. But this time jump and time travel theory are my least favorite theory. It feels a little bit boring and more Marvel-esque than I'd expect from Mass Effect. And with everything I just explained, the potential for a connection between dark energy, element zero, and the scourge has already been established. All of these three elements are all involved in time and space warping and direct travel, and all of them connect to element zero as well. I truly do think that there are a million possibilities, story-wise, since everything about the dark energy, the Scourge, the Jardan, and the Geth are so open-ended that there aren't many constraints when it comes to forming new stories around the existing lore. And involving all of this, there is an even bigger mystery than what is the Scourge. And that's where did the Scourge come from? As of right now, the current information that is known about the Scourge is that it was supposedly released into the Helios Cluster around 2450 after a powerful weapon was detonated on key to Sira during some kind of conflict between the Jardan and an unknown race. Scans tell us that the Jeln was teaching moves to whatever opposition the Jardan were facing. In one of the scans on Meridian, you learn that there was a race or individual known as Jeln. The data, which is translated from remnant language, says opposition's next moves learn from secrets from Jeln. Take action, protect the work. Individual life is nothing. The machine of life is everything. So the Jardan were warring with some unknown race and a weapon and possible artificially made scourge was intentionally spread throughout the entire Helios cluster due to whatever was going on with this war. So it seems like the Jardan were in control of the Helios cluster. There was some kind of major conflict going on. And then roughly 300 years before the initiative even arrived, the Scourge is detonated because of this war. And I'll get more into the Jardan, the Jeln, the Remnant, and their AI connections in my next video, so I'm mostly going to focus on the origin of the Scourge here. But who is Jeln, or who are the Jeln? And does this point to the Scourge and detonation of the weapon being intentional, as maybe a, as a way to protect the work? And was the Jardan taking action? Did they release the Scourge to deter something from being in the Helios Cluster? Was it some kind of last Hail Mary to save both themselves and the Angara and Helios Cluster that they worked so hard to foster and grow? Or was the Scourge an accident? Was it made specifically to target the Jardan's remnant technology by a Jardan adversary? Was it released knowing it would negatively affect the Angara? Was it intentionally released to stop the progression of the Helios Cluster? And was it released to stop the Jardan's work involving their Angara templates? There are so many mysteries around the actual origins and histories behind the Scourge that this is another aspect that could be expanded upon in the next game. And ultimately, while this is all extremely fun to speculate about, Mary DeMarle and the Mass Effect team are far more imaginative than me and will definitely come up with something more creative and innovative. But still, here is how I think Dark Energy, The Scourge, Element Zero, Conrad Werner, and Dying Stars could tie into the next game. First with The Scourge. We know from the timeline that The Scourge was apparently detonated in 2450, which is in the middle of both known games' timelines. But I wonder if the space anomalies that are being spoken of in the trailer could tie into Mass Effect 3's ending. We never truly learn the aftermath of what happens after Shepard's decision, nor do we see if there's any domino effects on the technology and galaxy as a whole. The ending is still very much a mystery. But what if the relays exploding or the crucible being activated set off some kind of ripple effect on the galaxy, especially since the dark energy crucible itself releases massive amounts of dark energy when it's fired. With the Crucible being a mystery and involving dark energy, it opens possibilities around the actual implementation of the choices and the aftermath. Everything I just explained about the dark energy, element zero, and time space also applies to the Crucible itself. And as we know, Mass Effect 3's ending is mostly unexplored. 
We get a few slides, but don't really know much of what happened afterwards. Maybe this opened wormholes because of the dark energy. Maybe it created another scourge. Maybe it created the scourge. Maybe it created black holes. I hope they expand upon this ending because it's largely a mystery as to how it actually works and how its blast and explosion had lasting effects on the galaxy. And it makes me wonder if there was more to just the choices given by the star child. Maybe it changed the galaxy as a whole. If synthetic is chosen, it would make sense things would be more affected because of the organics and synthetics merging. But in the Destroy ending, Hackett says everything can be rebuilt. But maybe it took years for them to discover anomalies. Or maybe Haystrom finally did die. And that resulted in some kind of dark energy surge or another possible black hole. At the time of Haystrom's destabilization, the Geth were in control of the Far Rim. Not only were they monitoring the activity of Haystrom, but they also housed several of their Geth units there. Maybe after the end of Mass Effect 3, Shepard's choice determines what the Geth did with Haystrom and if it even survives the ending choice. While I've said a million times, there's a ton of ways that the Geth could survive the Destroy ending. What if they didn't and were then later reactivated? The Corians did house Geths in their suits. And especially if you establish peace between them, they would be more inclined to help the Geth. They could have easily reactivated them and then put their minds into Geth bodies and they could essentially rebuild them. It would almost be poetic. Maybe the Angara found the Geth. Or maybe the Jardan found them and help them rebuild, since I think the Jardan could have experience with synthetics. What if the Geth were using the Geth telescope to look into space and find these anomalies and knew about them before anybody else? What if the strange technology, in the technology that the Geth were using to circumvent the radiation from Dolan, was more dark energy technology? What if it had protective dark energy barriers just like Object Row? What if their strange technology was also from an undiscovered species or even the Jardan? They were monitoring something and they had access to unknown strange technology. And while from what we know of the current Geth telescope's findings, it was only being used as a telescope, but it was a real-time telescope. What if they were using the telescope to monitor dark energy? or found early traces of the Scourge or a similar dangerous material connected to anomalies all across space? What if they even found a way to leave the Milky Way galaxy with that strange technology that they had access to and we just don't know that they were able to do this? What if they even made it to Andromeda? What if the Geth, who are definitely returning, help share their findings as a way to become accepted into the Citadel races and used it as a way of earning trust. The Geth we've seen don't look like anyone is afraid of them. They look like they're peacefully existing. This tells me a peace of some kind has been established with the Geth, or at least with this one. The Angara looks to be pointing at the Geth, but everyone else is pretty unaffected. So while this aspect is confusing, the Geth is still largely unbothered and unnoticed. And what if this Geth here next to this possible Ezo-filled crater died trying to help, died trying to discover something, or died trying to share their findings? It wouldn't make sense for them to be the antagonist again. I just don't see that being the case in Mass Effect 5. I think if anything, we will be helping them become established as a recognized race. And I can see all of these possibilities leaning into a more sympathetic view of the Geth to the other races. And I for sure think the Geth and their telescope will be involved in the next game, especially because this Mudskipper ship is labeled XT-8, which is actually the name of a popular telescope. And the organization of the letters XT-8 uses the Andromeda naming convention. The Nomad was the ND-1. So hinting at a telescope and using Andromeda naming convention could mean that this specific piece of concept art was hinting at the Andromeda Telescope, aka the Geth Telescope, aka the Kalos Array. And yes, I do need to go out and touch grass. I'm very aware of this. But like Dark Energy, Element Zero, and the Scourge, 
the telescope could potentially involve travel. And maybe this technology is eventually used to create real-time intergalactic travel, the same way it works with observing the galaxy in almost real time. And the Geth's connection to AI is very important, as it relates to everything we know in Andromeda as well. The Jardin may have been pure or partial synthetics, and we do find ancient AI on Vold. We also know that Ryder is special because of their connection with Sam. And all that brings me to why I think the Geth will be important moving forward. In the games, Legion and Edie are really the only synthetics that we build important relationships with. And Mass Effect 3 is the only game in the trilogy where that's explored on a deeper level. It makes sense for Mass Effect 5 to continue explorations of synthetic versus organics in a way that continues to humanize the synthetics without making them the enemy again. It would make sense story-wise, and I think it would also just be heavily enjoyed by the fandom. While the Koreans are more sided with amongst the fandom because of Tally, the actual statistics show that more people side with the Geth than the Koreans when it comes to the final choice on Rannoch, which is a pretty interesting statistic. Additionally, looking at this poster again, maybe this could have been what the Geth were observing. An Element Zero rich planet, maybe they were going to use the Element Zero to leave the galaxy. Or maybe there is a buried relay within this planet, and the Geth were planning on extracting it. Maybe they encountered an enemy race protecting it. Or there was some kind of battle here. Maybe the Geth were already here when something crashed on top of them, as we don't see a ship or ship debris directly in the crater. I'm not sure, but this poster seems to connect this planet with this Ezo-filled crater, and this is all connected to the Geth. And this squad that it looks like it has Rex here is possibly exploring whatever previously happened. Or maybe this is old and it's from the Morning War. Or the Crucible explosion and we're seeing the aftermath of the endings. The Geth don't look like they had weapons or reinforcement, so who knows what they were up to here. But whatever they were doing, it got them killed. So yes, bringing back the Geth humanizing them and advancing them as a recognizable citadel race makes sense. And I think their telescope and whatever knowledge they had and whatever they've been studying and observing could all be connected to that. Maybe they replicated this technology and helped build a new relay or help build this new relay type looking construct. Could this relay be being built with newfound technology that makes instant travel possible? even across galaxies? Could this relay here be founded on new tech or strange tech? Maybe this is another way that the Geth contributed to the greater galaxy. Maybe they're behind the building of this. That one's a stretch, especially with the Cerberus colors, but maybe Liara is speaking to a Geth about it. Maybe the Geth even helped unlock relays that were previously inaccessible or found brand new relays or were able to find new technology because of their telescope. Their telescopes really open up a million possibilities. They could have easily discovered what was happening in Andromeda following the years after the initiative left. And while the Scourge isn't detonated until 2450, maybe the Geth saw the warring between the Jardin and whoever they were in conflict with within the years before the detonation on Ketisira. That kind of telescope being able to observe the galaxy in almost real time would have given the Geth access to an unbelievable amount of information, especially within the Milky Way galaxy itself. And we still don't know what they were actively looking for or at. There's a ton of story possibilities here surrounding the Geth and their telescope and the Milky Way and even Andromeda. And that brings me again to the Scourge. We know that Andromeda is being included in this game. It's undeniable. While it may not have a huge connection, I think there's a few obvious ways to connect the games, and that can make it feel more cohesive, and that starts with connecting the Scourge to dark energy. Like I said earlier, what if Dolan does go supernova and eventually becomes a black hole, and we see another Scourge-like event? What if this affects the element zero within the galaxy? 
What if the scourge was artificially created and the Geth were observing its creation or the race that created it? What if the scourge we encounter in Andromeda isn't the first detonation of the scourge and it was also in the Milky Way galaxy? There's still so much unexplored in the Milky Way galaxy and while there's a ton of mysteries in this small area that we have explored, there's a million more mysteries outside of the council space and places that Shepard visited. The team could easily make the Scourge be something that was discovered in the timeline after the events of Mass Effect 3, and because of the time jump, could make it so that it originated in the Milky Way galaxy and then was detonated two or 300 years later in Andromeda. Dark energy, dying stars, and the Scourge seem to be the most simple elements to focus on. Even if Andromeda isn't heavily included in Mass Effect 5, including story elements that could help explain what does happen in Andromeda, I think would make a lot of Andromeda fans happy, while also just expanding on the universe, especially since I don't think we'll be getting a true Andromeda sequel. Establishing connections to Ryder's story while not being able to actively go there would help resolve some of the lingering questions left in Andromeda. And there's been some speculation about this specific concept art piece and its similarities to the beam from Mass Effect 3. If this could be related to new travel technology or dark energy, or maybe that blue tint is from Element Zero. If Element Zero was being used here, it could lower an individual's mass and transport them directly to a planet or some other location which was actually related to an unused concept by Matt Rhodes. After Mass Effect 3's ending, he speculated that after synthesis, all the races would link to the nearest relay because of their new synthetic connection, and they'd be able to jump to any world that they chose, surface to surface. This effect would start changing their biology and the biology of every being, and they would essentially merge far, far into the future into a similar race. This was his speculation and was never expanded upon, but if these are similar to the beams from Mass Effect 3, this could mean that this element of travel has been realized, and it would mean that direct travel is now possible. And we don't really know exactly how these beams worked anyways, since they were created by the Reapers, but expanding on the ending choice in Mass Effect 3, maybe this technology became accessible or maybe this technology was already being used by the Geth and their strange technology. And part of what's so interesting is it looks like cars are headed directly towards the bottom of this beam. So maybe this is a transport hub and these sky cars are traveling between worlds. And this is some kind of actual transport beam that can transfer sky cars and you don't need a faster than light ship. This could be an interesting way to utilize Reaper tech in the future while also advancing the Milky Way races. And from the 2022 teaser clip of the relay, we see some kind of anomaly across the screen. They seem to shimmer and slither across the video. Either this is some kind of intentional distortion to hide something on the feed, or this could be a ship or something being cloaked by new technology. And this could be the introduction of a new race and maybe that's why we're seeing the 314 T's, or this is a new use of dark energy, which we know that Object Rho utilized dark energy as a sort of force field and barrier. Maybe dark energy is being utilized here as well. This one is a bit of a stretch, but this distortion isn't really talked about a lot. And I think that's essentially because there's just so many possibilities here. It could be new tech, a new race, or tech that was around and was being hidden. It could be related to AI or the Jardin or the Geth, but these anomalies will probably end up being important later on. Additionally, with dark energy, the Scourge, black holes, element zero, the Geth and the Geth telescope, they're all involved in different aspects of time-related events. So I wonder if the message from last year's N7 day could be related to all of the time travel possibilities, especially since it says post nebula. And a nebula is a giant cloud of dust and gas in space. Some nebula 
come from the gas and dust thrown out by the explosion of a dying star, such as a supernova. The date says 2819, which we know is from Ryder's timeline. And it says that this message was encrypted. And we know that the message ends up being Liara, saying, although they should know by now not to underestimate human defiance, how is Liara connected to Andromeda here? Could all of these time travel possibilities have opened up a wormhole for communication? Could Liara's message have been sent to 2819, setting up a future return if the next game doesn't take place in Andromeda's timeline? Or maybe this audio was sent from Andromeda since it does say Andromeda distress signal detected. Year sent 2819. Maybe with all the possible time space anomalies, this message is from the past. Or maybe Liara really is in 2819 and sent this message. But what's interesting about this is that when Gamble originally shared this quote, it was in the audio from the relay clip, where it sounds like Liara is either speaking to a geth or a geth is speaking while listening to Liara. So there's some kind of connection to the audio, the relay, the geth, and Liara, while also all connecting to Andromeda. And I also think that this piece of concept art could be connected as well. There was a security breach, and the warning tells us to contact Systems Alliance. The first access codes are accepted, and then we see the warning. So was this Liara hacking the system? Was the Geth hacking the system? Was the N7 hacking the system? Would the N7 even need to if they were an N7? Wouldn't an N7 have access to Systems Alliance information? And additionally, the concept art that Gamble shared for N7 Day had this Liara quote, but the image looks like it's from a location from the original trilogy, not somewhere in Andromeda. We don't know of anywhere in Andromeda that had advanced to this level. If this Andromeda message was sent in 2819, did this message end up in some kind of wormhole being sent to the past? This piece of information is very hard to put together because it being sent from Andromeda doesn't necessarily make sense with what we know. So there's a ton of questions here. And this being Liara in 2819, sending a message back to the Milky Way, maybe that is what is going on. But all the time and travel possibilities could be related to this quote, the concept art and the relay that we hear the Geth and Liara speaking over. And with a direct Andromeda sequel most likely out of the question, I think, I could see a ways to pull in Andromeda like this, or even setting up a future visit to the Andromeda timeline. And I think the Jardan could be the main key to the next game because of this reason. Aside from the Dark Energy and the Scourge, they are the perfect tie-in between the two timelines and stories. And I'll explore that next time, but there's one more connection that I want to see return in some form, and that's Shepard's biggest fan. And you're probably wondering what Conrad Werner has to do with Dark Energy and Mass Effect 5. But while Conrad Werner is probably Mass Effect's biggest meme, and he has been a running joke for several years, you might not be familiar with his secret. He's actually a genius and may very well be the key to Mass Effect 5's plot. So let's go over Conrad's connection to Dark Energy and how Conrad Werner helped build the Dark Energy Crucible. First, let's talk about Conrad Werner. In Mass Effect 3, Conrad actually writes a dissertation about Dark Energy and gives it to Shepard, which counts as a war asset. The Codex entry in the game says, published years ago by Dr. Conrad Werner, this doctoral dissertation on xenotechnology is a lengthy but intriguing argument that dark energy causes a minute but empirically observable difference in the passage of time. Hotly debated when first published, the paper's theory is supported by recent data. The dissertation illuminates several instructions left by the Protheans on how to build the Crucible. So essentially, Conrad wrote an entire dissertation about how dark energy causes a small but observable passage of time, 
and he was ahead of the times with his knowledge. And we know that dark energy was important in Mass Effect 2, but has connections throughout the entire universe and both the original trilogy and Andromeda, while also being rooted in real science. And it seems like at the time of Conrad's dissertation being published, it was very debated and unsupported. But new data changed, and it is now supported by recent data, which means more scientists were beginning to also research dark energy and its connection to the passage of time and agreed with Conrad. And while Conrad Werner might be an annoying superfan who romanticizes the Spectre program to the point that he becomes an insufferable idiot and goes so far as to steal an N7 armor set to impersonate Shepard, he's actually a good dude. Well, if you do the Paragon route with him anyways. In Mass Effect 2, he even starts a charity for refugees and orphans called Shepherds. He tells Shepard in Mass Effect 3 that he spent almost all of his money getting the children off-world to save them from Reaper attacks. So, while he may be an idiot, he also has a big heart. In his quest to both help the galaxy and help Shepard, he even stupidly joins Cerberus due to Shepard's affiliation. After being set straight by Shepard on the Citadel, he agrees to help and reveals that he has a doctoral degree in Xenoscience and then he sends Shepard a copy of his dissertation on dark energy. He also goes so far as to help you with ancient tech schematics to help with the Crucible. He contacts Gavin Hossel from Zoo's Hope in Mass Effect 1, who sends the schematics over per Conrad's request. If you also obtain the 10 Matriarch Dilanaga's writings from Mass Effect 1 and the Elkos Combined Armory License, those combined with Conrad's dissertation will be able to translate the schematics. It's a lot of work from Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 to get all of this unlocked, but once you do, you're able to use his schematics and dark energy knowledge and help with the Crucible. And for all the reasons I just spoke of, I do think Conrad's dissertation could end up becoming important, even if he isn't around. Dark energy could be one of the most logical ways to connect the two games, while also bringing back a thread that fans want continued. So yes, I hope we see Conrad return for the memes and for the chance that his dissertation might be an important piece of lore for the next game. But it's also important to remember that there are many pieces to even get this outcome. You have to paragon Conrad for all three games. You have to find all 10 Matriarch writings. You have to help Gavin Hossel, and you have to have helped Jenna in Mass Effect 1, or Conrad is shot dead by the Cerberus agent in Mass Effect 3. Conrad can die in every game. If you're interested in seeing every choice and outcome, check out Big Dan's video that I've linked below. And I do also wonder if he and Jenna finally got together and he actually has a real wife. Obviously, he'd only be able to return in the next game if it takes place close to Mass Effect 3, or if he is put in some kind of cryosleep, which I would find very unlikely, but his sister did go into cryo to make it to Andromeda, so who knows? And a fun fact about Conrad Werner is that there is a theme park attraction called Mass Effect New Earth. And in the attraction, Conrad is actually the captain of the ship and he's taking the riders to Terra Nova. The ride has been around for several years, so at this point, Conrad has actually been around longer than Shepard. And I also just want to say that all of this is pure speculation, and I know how crazy with how much I've thought about all this that I sound. Please entertain my delusions, but at the same time, this is all just speculation. I 100% understand that everything that we're looking at is just clues and hints and that things may change during development. So while speculating and theorizing is fun, it is just speculation and it is just theory crafting. And realistically, Mass Effect 5 is not coming out for a while. So we have a lot to theorize and a lot of time. But now that I've gone over my theories, I wanna go over some theories that I asked for on Twitter. I saw this interesting theory about the Geth contacting Meridian and that opened up some additional thoughts. 
the Geth telescope could observe the Helios cluster in almost real time, but specifically in the time frame before the initiative left, and at that time it was free of the scourge, and the cluster itself was thriving. But it would have also meant that the remnant technology also wasn't around. The Angara were created centuries ago, long before the scourge and long before the initiative finds them. Could the Geth have made observations of the Angara, or even made contact with them? Could their synthetic origins allow them to transfer their unit to different platforms across galaxies, and then even rebuild their own bodies elsewhere? That is a super stretch, but it sounds kind of plausible. The Geth were barely explored, and I bet their technology, on top of whatever strange technology they had, would have opened up a ton of possibilities. And I wouldn't be surprised if they knew about other races and had far more knowledge of the entire universe than anyone else. I've also seen a lot of theories using dark energy to create a time travel situation in which Shepard is pulled in from a different spot on the timeline. And I don't think situations like this are possible unless they re-establish what already happened with a time travel loop, meaning essentially everything that happened was meant to happen. And what happened in the past was reinforced by something that happened in the future. So I don't see this really changing Shepard's outcome in a way that would make sense. And I've also seen the theory that the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda galaxy's timelines could essentially coexist. And I think what I just said about the time travel loop applies to this as well. This concept cannot exist if it changes the timelines that have already been completed. I just have no idea what this could do to the timeline. So I don't know how this could even be possible. Nor do I think development-wise that this is even feasible. They'd have to build two entire games, two protagonists and both sets of companions, two ships, all the additional worlds. That sounds like an unreasonable amount of development resources. So I just don't think that this is happening. I've also seen time travel theories related to the lost Corian Ark. And since the Corian Ark is possibly Ark 6, maybe even the Corian Ark was lost in a wormhole or got sucked into time travel or something else along those lines where it moved along the timeline. I don't really see that happening, but the last confirmed message from the Kilosea was in 2753. And nothing else is known after that. So again, this is another concept that could be explored, but if it's near the timeline of Mass Effect 3, time travel or wormholes would have to be used to connect the arc. I've also seen a lot of theories about possible time dilation, which could be possible with all the dark energy, element zero, and space-time issues between dark energy and the Scourge. But I do think if they do this, it would maybe feel a bit too similar to Exodus, which is heavily focusing on time dilation as their main core concept. So maybe, but again, I still don't really know how I feel about time travel, wormholes, or time dilation in Mass Effect. And finally, the last concept I wanna cover is that the two galaxies will collide in the future. And I don't think this is happening because this isn't speculated to happen for five more billion years there would have to be an insane amount of activity to cause something this major to happen and speed up the process that much. And I think there would also be a lot of casualties in both galaxies if this happened. And with both galaxies having black holes, scientists have little knowledge of what would actually happen. But aside from the several impacts and reorganizing of planets, they suspect the solar system would be largely unharmed but the night sky would be drastically altered. And the Milky Way galaxy is already thought to have consumed more than a dozen galaxies over billions of years. So while the Milky Way is always changing, I don't see this happening in Mass Effect. Both universes are distinct and carry their own stories, and I just don't see a reason to combine them. They each have unique distinctions and histories, and I think it removes some of the mystery of the galaxy if you just combine them. It also removes a bit of what makes Mass Effect so special, and that to an extent, Mass Effect reflects a futuristic scenario of our real world. So ultimately, I hope they don't go that route, nor do I think they will. 
So here are all my dark energy theories and a few from some of you. And there's also still a lot to explore about the dark energy and scourge potentials that have more connections to the Jardin and their history. And I'll go more into that into my deep dive into my Jardin video. But what do you think about all these theories? Which one stands out to you the most? And which ones would you like to see in Mass Effect 5? And do you have any theories that I didn't cover? And if you're still here, just know that I am not going anywhere. There was quite a bit of negativity about Mass Effect 5 still being in pre-production, which honestly shouldn't have surprised anyone since we knew this back in August. But regardless, I'm here for the long haul. I have several more Mass Effect videos in the works, and while we wait for Mass Effect 5 to come out, I'll still be covering other games, such as Exodus and Humanoid Origins upcoming IP. And thank you so much for watching my videos. I'm actually going to be doing a giveaway of some of the Mass Effect stickers I've designed. Just leave a comment with the word stickers in it to enter. And if you want to learn more about the Geth Telescope, here is a video breaking down everything that we know, as well as a theory about dying stars and dark energy. Check these out and let me know what you think. And a special thank you to my channel members. Thank you for all your support and see you next time.